Okay, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. If you would please turn off your cameras and mute yourselves, I'd appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and get started, okay? All right. Okay, so Jessica, um, as you may or may not know, she is the founder of Workology, which is a workplace resource for human resources. Um, she is, uh, also serves recruiting professionals and business leaders. Um, her site has been listed twice as a top 75 career resource by Forbes magazine. Um, she is the president and CEO of Exceptional HR, which is a human capital strategy company. And um, she is the published author of Tweet This. So you may wanna ask her questions about that. She is perceived to be a top 50 social media power user by Forbes magazine. And um, she's got a ton of experience, expertise in um, human resources. She's been sought after um, for all kinds of publications, including The Economist, Forbes, the CIO Magazine, CBS, Entrepreneur Magazine, and Sherm's HR Magazine. So I am delighted to have Jessica here. She's got a lot of great information to share. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, for some reason, Jessica, I don't see you on camera, but um, I am here. you are here. Okay, there we go. All right, so before we get started, we want to learn about you and your background and how, how you got here in your life and career. Well, I, you know what, I just want to record that first part that you just said and like listen to it every morning because <laughs> I feel like it's a great way to start the day. Um, so I uh, moved to Oklahoma City, when was that? 2007, I guess. And my husband is a uh, Norman native, born and raised. And when we got engaged, we decided to, to make Oklahoma City our home. And um, we're now in Austin, Texas, but um, I was looking for jobs and I felt like I was in the same, there wasn't anything really interesting or that stood out as an HR leader about me. And so I started, I decided to start a blog and originally the blog was about human resources or sorry, it was about job search strategy. And I worked at the Office Max sales center in Norman um, is kind of where I landed. And we were using my blog to funnel candidates because they would shift um, in new headcount, 350 or 500 people a quarter. And the expectation was that I would hire those people instantaneously, right? Which isn't realistic. So I was using the blog to build a bench and um, it started working. And so early on, this is uh, 2008, 2009, 30% um, of my hires were coming from Twitter and MySpace, um, which I was finding that um, the retention for social media candidates that came through my blog and um, these social media sites was far stronger and longer than traditional methods. So um, I ended up, um, Office Max was really worried about my blog. It was uh, not an, it was an anonymous blog. It was Jessica M. It wasn't even my full last name. You couldn't figure out who I was. Um, and I ended up getting fired because of my blog. Okay. And um, I took the opportunity to use this as a, as a way to help educate um, my boss and people like my boss and my boss's boss. And so now we serve 800,000 HR leaders every single month with our uh, resources all, all over podcast, YouTube. We have courses with newsletter blogs for days. Wow. Wow. How about tweet this? How did that come about? Um, I fell in love with Twitter. So um, when I was pregnant, I, um, I actually was speaking at, um, I think it was the Oklahoma City um, uh, Human Resource Group or something. And one of the women said, you do MySpace, you do Facebook. Can you talk about Twitter on this panel? So I had joined Twitter, um, but I didn't like it very much. And so um, I joined, I restarted my account again and um, had to talk about it on this panel. And it was really great um, because while I was pregnant and then ultimately when I was out of work, while I was on maternity leave, uh, it was a great way to, to build relationships and meet new people. And um, so I started the first tweet up in Oklahoma City and um, I think it was probably about 2009, 2010, we had a number of meetups that would bring 500 to 700 people at different wow. restaurants in the Oklahoma City area. And it was awesome because you would just meet all the people that you had been talking to on Twitter from the Oklahoma City Metro. Uh, so my account grew really fast and I decided to write a book about how to use it. So that is um, how Tweet This and the Twitter book started. Came about, very cool, very cool. All right. Well, you know, with COVID on the rise again, lots of companies are struggling with having employees on the job, providing a hybrid working environment, letting people work from home. Do you think that this is permanent? And what do you think the future is going to look like around the work environment? 
gosh, I hope it's permanent. Um, yeah. I think I was telling Donna <laughs> yesterday that um, I love like remote work because um, I'm able to still work wherever I am. Like I said, I was working in Jamaica. Um, this was, it's kind of a working vacation, but, mm -hmm. um, but my daughter also does virtual school. She's 13 and it's um, through a program at the Houston ISD, although we live in Austin. And so it's all online. Um, so we're able to travel and go to Mexico, go to Florida, go to different places, and she can still stay engaged um, with school, but still be able to be connected um, and, and have the freedom and flexibility. Employees are looking for this. They want to be, have the freedom to be able to come and go um, as needed or to be able to work in an environment that they can customize. Um, particularly people with disabilities, they uh, really wanna work at home or uh, people with families because the environment is set up for them to be successful. So um, I know that a lot of business owners I'm a business owner too. Um, they want people to come back to the office. We might have invested in a lot of money into a long-term lease or um, some building space. And, and that has um, a big price tag that we're paying in every single month. Uh, but if you want to be able to retain your talent and you want to be able to attract new people um, that is as competitive as the larger organizations, we're going to have to continue to offer some sort of hybrid situation, um, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis. My team that's here in Austin, um, I have an office manager who comes in pretty much every day to open our office because I also own a co-working space here in town. Um, but then I have one team member who really comes in once a week. And honestly, I come in once or twice a week. The rest of my team is all remote. Some of them I haven't even met in person. And um, that is going to be, I think, continuing for, for the foreseeable for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Well, one of the things that comes up, I was working with a client that was trying to figure this out, <clears throat> is keeping employees engaged and working together as a team when they are working remotely. Do you have any thoughts about that or best practices you're aware of? Um, so this is something that employers are really thinking about. I just had a conversation this week. Uh, his name is Darren Murph, and he's the head of remote for a company called GitLab. And I'm going to be interviewing him on my podcast um, in March. And um, he was hired just to look at engagement and retention and keeping in people who are working remotely, feeling like they're connected. Uh, mm -hmm. He focuses a lot on employee onboarding, which I feel like is the most challenging when you're remote is you don't have those relationships. You haven't looked at people in the eye. So how do you keep different people connected? And um, there are, when I did a quick Google search or did a quick LinkedIn search, there are about 65 people in, uh, that I found in LinkedIn that are listed as like the head of remote or remote manager. So it's a growing trend uh, that we're, we're seeing more. Um, I like to have systems and processes to engage my team. We have regular standing meetings twice a week. They're um, very quick, like 30 minutes, but it allows us to be able to look at each other face to face. Right, right. That's key. Well, like, the other thing is talk about the impact of the remote work on women, will you specifically? This one is, I, I don't think we fully know the impact, uh, the effects on this, but I pulled a stat um, and let me read it because it's, it's pretty telling. Um, so this comes from Lean In and McKinsey and Company um, and from their Women in the Workplace 2020 report. And they found that between March and September of 2020, over 1.1 million people left the workplace, okay? Uh, most of them were women. So out of 1.1 million, 865,000 were women, 216,000 were men. A lot of the reason that these women left the workplace was because they needed to do household chores, taking care of kids, um, supporting their, their partner. Maybe they were the breadwinner in the family. So this is, in my mind, set women back in some instances over 200 years, because now um, we are even more undervalued um, than we were before. Uh, taking it a step further, I'm also thinking about women who are, are persons of color too, and how they're even further being impacted. Um, when we look at today and right now, um, an average white household makes $117,000. And an average household for a person of color makes $7,000. So we add in this um, child care factor and um, women who had to make a choice for their family to be able to homeschool or support their children in this uncertain times. 
it's going to continue to impact uh, women and uh, women of color and those families for um, hopefully not hundreds of years, but for a very long time. Yeah. Any thoughts about what we do about that? Um, so I, I got really emotional because the stat was the stat um, on the disparity between uh, families mm-hmm. uh, was shared with me from a podcast that I did actually this week. And I got re- emotional about it. And I was like, okay, how can I help? And I really think that we need to support more um, Black-owned businesses, or women-owned businesses, minority groups, um, find ways to work with vendors, if you're a business owner, of somebody who is a, a minority group and be able to support them. A lot of times as a business owner, um, and I say this from experience, we can't really tell people what's going on because we are the face of the business. Right. So we're out here. Everything's great. Our business is rocking and it's rolling. And then behind the scenes with our best friend or maybe our inner circle, we're like, I have worked 120 hours this week. I don't know how I'm going to pay my people. Like there's all these things that are going behind the scenes. So um, we really need to be able to support each other and if able, um, focus on um, minority vendors and resources and services to be able to support them. Great point. Great point. All right. So um, I know that you're planning on doing a course, I think, on uh, utilizing virtual assistants, but let's talk about that. A lot of our uh, entrepreneurs here may have virtual assistants or have been considering it. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about how that's working for you, where you found them, the benefits to having one? I um, have been working with virtual assistants for um, almost five years. And uh, the first one I brought on was from Argentina. I use a service called iWorker. And um, it it was, it was, um, I would say my first VA, um, she was wonderful, but, um, I really didn't know what I didn't know. And I Mm -hmm. am very certain I burnt her out. She was amazing. Um, but she didn't feel comfortable talking to me to tell me when I was giving her too much. Um, and I didn't have the system set up to be able to support and train her. So, uh, when we work with our VAs and we have seven that we work with, um, and they're all across the world, primarily Argentina and Kenya, and, and they do a variety of things for us. We have video, we have two video editors. Um, I have somebody who reads my email. I have somebody who updates my CRM. We have graphic designers. We have people who work through the transcription of my podcast so that, um, I, and, and my team here in the U S we can focus on, uh, the, the business side of what we, what we need to do. So um, the key is training for your VAs. Uh, We do a lot of um, autonomous training where I record a video or my team, somebody on my team records a video and tells them how to do a thing. A lot of them, um, depending upon who you talk to, um, they have skills in certain areas. So we have so many because they specialize in different things. When you do the interview with your VA, they're going to tell you that they can do all the things, but they just want a job. And I get that. And um, they want to look as attractive as possible, but it's really overwhelming when they say, I can do social media, I can write blogs, I can check your email, and I can do graphic design. That's really for people. So um, the training piece is is really specific and unique. So like I said, I record normally like a two to seven minute video that explains how to do something. Maybe it's checking my email or responding to things. Um, And then we use Trello. Uh, for our project management and team management. So each of my team has a board, whether they're a VA or not, and they have daily activities, monthly activities, other things that um, are trickling up kind of one-time projects. And it has really specific instructions and information. We upload the video there. And then that way um, I let them know, hey, I would just put something on your board. And I normally communicate with them through Slack primarily. So they can let me know if we need to hop on a call to have more questions, but they also join the team meetings. Um, Everybody's on the Wednesday call, but then our key um, team members are on the Monday call. Um, And it has worked really well for us to be able to get things done. Uh, The main challenge I have now is keeping up with them because they're so good at what they do. I have to keep finding more things for them to take care of. So I'm the one sometimes slowing them down because they're like, I don't have anything on my board that's new. And so then I have to make time um, to decide, okay, what are the key, key projects or things that I can be able to tap into their um, assistance with? Very good. Our technology provider, uh, part of them is in uh, India, and they have used Loom to do mm-hmm. things with me, to explain things with me, which if you're not familiar with Loom, guys, you can record the screen as you're doing it and you're talking down in the corner. It's awesome. Okay, very good. 
Um, okay, so what trade-offs do you see between addressing employee safety, attracting and retaining employees, driving performance, engaging employees, um, and providing employees with the flexibility they need? There's lots of trade-offs here. Um, I think it kind of depends on the positions, um, if they're in person versus remote only. I mean, remote only, um, you know, it's really, for, for me, it's about being a better manager and leader so I can help them have that flexibility that they need. They have an understanding of what they need to do and then hold them accountable. Um, because I, again, a lot of times I feel like we get in our, the way of our people. And a lot of times uh, we may not have worked remotely. And so we don't know how to lead and engage people outside of just seeing them in the, in the office, like in the kitchen or different places. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of those extra kind of touch bases that we would have in person are not happening the same way. So I like to check in with all my people and, and I just do it on Slack and I'll say, hey, what's going on with you? How's it going? I make sure to remember birthdays important events. Um, several of our team members are musicians. So if they have any music coming out, like we celebrate with them, we sing happy birthday to somebody on our Wednesday call. So I always try to make sure to recognize one person on my team publicly every time I have a regular meeting too. Um, if we're talking about in person, I feel like um, we do want to make sure that we're communicating with them also. Um, especially when it comes to safety or what your policy is, because what they're hearing on the news, especially with the Supreme Court decision that came down, really, and I'm still trying to digest everything, um, we, we do need to be informed and maybe just send out a little email memo, maybe a Slack message, and maybe a video that says the same thing, but in different mediums, to just say, here's what we're doing to ensure your safety. If you have symptoms, here's what I want you to do. Yes, we're still doing temperature checks. No, we aren't. Um, but be very clear about what you're doing to make sure that people um, feel comfortable coming to you. I don't want people in my office coming to work if they have flu symptoms, because I don't want to be on the news about the start of a super spreader event. That would be the worst thing for my business. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, are there any other best practices you're hearing out there? Or remote or in person? Yeah, for, for well, both. You know, just, just right now, during this time of COVID, keeping employees engaged, managing performance, anything else? You've got some great practices in place. Um, I, I mean, I still think we should be meeting with people monthly, one-on-ones um, mm -hmm. -on and documenting those somewhere. Um, I, I, we also do something on Slack that works really well for us because I am, um, I have an undiagnosed, but I'm very certain I have ADHD. So when somebody sends me a message to, on Slack, I want to do it right away. It's a, almost a compulsive thing. Like uh -huh. I get rid of everything and I'm like, oh, I need to respond to this thing. That's not important that I could do at any time. So, um, my team also doesn't know, um, what I view is urgent or not urgent. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when we send a Slack message of something that's going on, we use the hashtag in our direct messages, urgent or not urgent. And that lets my team know if it's something that needs to happen right now within the next you know, 24 hours or if it's not urgent. And then that way I can stay on this meeting and not be distracted and have to you know, waste my time because part of us being business owners and leaders in an organization is our ability to lead and prioritize and, and really manage our productive time as well as others. So that's one thing that has really worked well for us. I have um, also spent a lot of time on agile methodologies because I wanted to make sure we're nimble and flexible. And so that's why we went to the Trello board. And um, then we have the stand-up call, which really they, they're 30 minutes long. 45 at the most for the team. And they tell me three things that they're working on and then if they need support with anything. And so we go through um, the entire team really quickly. There's, there might be 10 people on the call at most, um, but it, it, it works for us. Uh, right now, it'll be a little bit different once we get larger. We also have sub teams too. So I have team leaders on my team and, and they have a group of people that they're responsible for that they also are checking in with too so that we can make sure that remotely or in person that these people feel like they're getting the support that they need. And if they have a question or they need some time off or they, they want to feel, I want them to feel comfortable if they have a question or if they think you know something's not happening or if they have a recommendation of maybe a new way of doing things. I want them to be able to talk to me about that. So we're going to... Yeah, by the way, guys, of course, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then we'll come back on screen with everybody in just a few minutes. Um, okay, I think that there's some understanding that managers have biases about the people that are working remotely. 
um, whether or not they're just as productive or whatever. How do we overcome that particular barrier? Um, I have always worked, I mean, I have led a remote team for the last 12 years. So I, I think really it's a trust factor and it's if you train your people and you hold them accountable, like with our, our project management program with our Trello board, uh, they're getting things done and they're doing the things. Mm -hmm. Just like you, I, I, well, I don't actually believe that people wake up every morning and say, oh, I think I'm going to F around today. I don't right, want to, no. I don't want to do it, the good job. I'm going to, I don't, I don't want to do a good job. Th those people are, it's, there's a small percentage of those people. And hopefully you haven't brought those people in your organization. So um, I am not a fan of these virtual time clock tools or these things where people all get on Zoom and you must be working in, in front of the computer um, with your video on. Um, there are tools that exist right now, or you can pay someone um, in India and they will move your mouse for you. They will log into your computer oh, and move your oh mouse for you so that the, the, the timekeeping tools think that you're working. So even if you utilize those kind of tools, it doesn't mean that the system can't be gamed. I mean, um, so I would just encourage you to train people accordingly, um, give them clear expectations, follow up with them and hold them accountable, just like you would do in person, but you're just doing it doing it remotely. And then um, I've had to fire people virtually. I think if you've been in HR, you've been a business leader, sometimes you have to call somebody and tell them it's not going to work out. Um, you can do that in today's world too. Sometimes I'll say like, hey, you know, um, this isn't working out for me. We, you know, you and I have been working together for the past three or four months to try to really make this work. What can I do to help you move on to the next place? Um, and, and sometimes they're just not a right fit for our environment. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. I just think if we're, if we be honest and open, uh, and hold people accountable for the most part, uh, they will do what we ask them to do, whether it's in person or remote, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I believe in protecting people's self-esteem and it being about fit to your point. I think that works really well when you're having those conversations. Um, all right. So Anything else about the implications of working remotely on teamwork? Honestly, uh, I, I feel like you can create a great virtual environment. It, you just have to be intentional. And sometimes it means asking people what they want because it's not about you. Um, as the leader, it's about the team and what they want. So that means asking and engaging and saying, hey, what kind of things will make it work better? Uh, we have a project manager of our podcast and she takes care of everything for us. And this all started because I said to everybody, Hey, I feel like we're having some problems with our podcast. We're not delivering to our clients on time. What ideas do you, do you have? And one of my people, Deja List, stood up and she said, I think you need to have one person be responsible for it and like be a project manager. And I'm like, that's a great idea. Is this something you would be interested in doing? Thank you for all relative. Yes. And she's like, absolutely. This is a new skill for her. She's excited. Um, she wants to start her own podcast. So this is a learning opportunity, but it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't asked the question. And everybody that's involved in the podcast, guests, my clients, we work with the Department of Labor um, for a few different initiatives with our podcast. Um, my podcast producer editor that does all the editing, he sent me a note over Christmas. I love working with her because things get done because before it was all on me and I was the one who was sending things off and I'm dealing, we're all dealing as business owners, business leaders with 300,000 things. The podcast submissions to my editor are not something that I should be using my valuable time for. That's what other team members on my team are for. And that all started with just asking and saying, hey, what, what do we need to do to make this better? Fair enough, fair enough. All right, Susan Cheris is asking, can you provide recommendations for training people remotely? Uh, what are the challenges and how do you resolve them? Um, so I, I like to be really clear with what we do. Uh, Loom, I use QuickTime, I'm a Mac user. So I use QuickTime Video Share. And then we, they all, each team member has a Google doc, a Google folder inside of our Google um, drive. And so that's shared to them. So all the resources and extra additional things are housed there. Now I have 12 people on my team, so I don't have um, 4,000 like Nan does. So it's not going to work necessarily the same, the same way. But what's nice is that we have organized the training. So if I'm training someone on how to use MailChimp, 
or how to write a blog or how to use Trello, we have that video that we can repurpose for later on. And it makes it a lot easier for me. So that when somebody steps into a new role, they already have maybe three hours of training that they can be doing and they can get started. I think that's the most frustrating part for new people is there's not really a system for onboarding. They feel like they're, they're the most engaged and excited, like their first six months in the job, certainly their first three weeks when they know nothing and they want to help, but they don't know how. So giving them some things to do and then checking in with them on a regular basis is really important. Um, but also when you're working with virtual people, it's also about you as the leader and you have to change your style to suit those people. And I'm going to give maybe a crude example, but it works for me. So I have two dogs. I have a Labrador. Um, she's 85 pounds and I have an Airedale Terrier who's about 60 pounds and there we love them. They're our people. They're my fuzzy people. And, um, they are, they were bad, like bad behaviors, jumping on counters, jumping on us, people that will come into the house and all the things. So I sent them for three weeks to a woman in our neighborhood that works with the dogs and she trained them. We went on vacation and came back and we had totally new dogs, Mm -hmm. but the real work was not the dogs had done the work. The real work was me and my husband and my daughter, because we had to change our habits and behaviors to be able to lead them and tell them what they needed to do. That includes giving clear direction, rewards and recognition, letting them know exactly what we wanted because that wasn't happening before. And now that they knew that there was a way for them to do that, we needed to change ourselves in order for us to work together. My whole goal was that I wanted to be able to go to Galveston or the beach in Texas and have my dogs be off leash and to enjoy themselves and we could enjoy themselves and I, and I could call them back verbal commands if I need it. And because we invested in the training and we invested in ourselves and made adjustments, we can do that now. And the relationship is so much better. So it is the same way with our people. Oh, oh good point. Good point. All right. So Ellen Graham was saying, what can you share about remote work or burnout? Um, so one of the things that we have done on my team is we don't take meetings on Fridays. No, normally I don't do meetings on Fridays. Um, you guys are, are a special a special thing, but my team does Thank not you. meet with anybody on Fridays. I try not to work on Friday. I want my people to take time off. So we encourage vacation. And I think you should too. If, if your people haven't taken some time off, that might be an opportunity for you to say, Hey, I noticed you haven't taken any time off recently. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what would you like to do? Or can I, how can I help you with this? Sometimes when we are overwhelmed, and on the verge of burnout, and I speak from experience, we don't know that we're there. So we need someone to say, hey, how can I help you? Or, hey, why don't you take a mental health day? Uh, Next Friday works for me. Um, And then in that silence, in that off time, I think we we realized like, oh, wow, like I, I got to sleep in. I didn't realize that I was as stressed as I was because I was living in the moment. And I think a lot of our people are in that place. So I would encourage um, taking some time off or maybe having somebody come in and do a meditation class or some sort of mental health um, training just to help people because we have dealt with a lot. And I, I know that whether you've had COVID or not, um, trauma has occurred and there is a lot of PTSD that we have experienced during this time that is going to start coming out, um, if not now, in, in the next year to 18 months. So giving your employees tools and resources and encouraging them to take time off and to do some things for themselves, I think is a, is a great plan. I just talked with, and I have, it's so awesome that we're talking because I just talked to all these great people this week. I talked to the vice president of HR for gym pass and their culture, obviously their gym pass. Um, she is able to take time off during the day to go to Pilates Uh, because that's their culture and not feel bad about being able to have a meeting, um, like be unavailable for an hour and a half so she can go to something during the day for her mental health. And I think that um, doing something like that, or even encouraging maybe people take walking meetings on conference calls uh, could be a really great start if your team is remote, or maybe there's just like a 45 minute time every day for, and you can start small with just a team where nobody has meetings. And you can do whatever you want during that time, um, I think is a great way to encourage 
people to just take a little bit of a break, but I don't think we know when we're in it. Like, unless we see a therapist every week and that therapist can kind of alert us to the signs or the things that we may be experiencing, uh, we're not that self-aware to know that we are on the edge of a, a breakdown or burnout. Yeah, well, that's a good point. The whole mental health issues coming back is going to be amazing. I mean, not amazing, difficult, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, how else do you think leadership has to change given this new world we're in? It starts. You said from, Go ahead. I would say it starts from the top. Um, what was working before was really not working. Honestly, mm -hmm. all our people wanted to be remote. They all wanted to live in a different place. Uh, they were just tethered to a location. Um, I live in Austin. I was here before everybody and their brother was moving here. I've been here uh, five years. Um, and it's, it's crazy. You've got people who are moving um, every single day. And it's a great city. Um, I keep telling people that it's full, that there's no more room. Um, don't, don't come, <laughs> don't come here. <laughs> don't come here. But um, people have the flexibility to be able to do that now. They've had a taste of it. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to recruit the best people, we're going to have to give some people some flexibility, um, especially if you're a small business, being able to recruit the right people to be able to do the job in your organization. I unless you're a brick and mortar and that's all you do, um, we're going to have to get a little flexible. I'm seeing a lot more organizations look globally for talent now because location isn't an issue. So you can really grab some really great inexpensive talent um, in a lot of places, uh, Mexico, Poland, Argentina, there's all these new um, areas that for, for like me and, and uh, some of my friends have really opened up. They've been able to get some really great people because the dollar is really strong in those countries. Uh, one of my people, he sent me a note about three months ago. Um, he's worked with me for a little over a year. His name's Christopher and he's our customer support person. So if you buy a course from us and need help, he's, he's the person that you interface with. And he is so invaluable to our team. Um, Argentina is really volatile and he's one of the few people in his family that's had a regular job for the last year. Mm -hmm. And working with me has allowed him to be able to buy a car, his first car. And he sent me a picture of um, that and just said, I, I love working with you. So um, these, when we employ people um, overseas or in other places globally, internationally, we're impacting them in a different way. And we're helping people in, in a different way. Um, I think we're, we're gonna have to get creative in how we retain our people. Um, even when it comes to benefits, like if, big cafeterias, I think are going to be the thing of the past. Indeed has a huge office here, or they have like four huge offices in Austin and the sale, the sale is the smoothie bar, the exercise place, all this stuff. Well, that doesn't matter anymore when um, you're remote. So in some ways I feel like as a smaller employer, we can have an advantage because they can interface with us as mm -hmm. the CEO of a small business more closely. Mm -hmm. And we can offer some benefits, maybe flexibility or some different things that maybe somebody like Indeed or whoever uh, won't be able to offer. Can't. You betcha. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's see here. So I just want you to talk for a second about the great reshuffle or the great resignation. Then we'll come to everybody for all the questions. Okay. But what do you think is going on? Um, I'm calling it the great realignment. That's my uh -huh. word for it is that people have dealt with a lot of crap over their time. And we've taken this pause uh -huh. and now people are saying, okay, I have faced death or I have had some downtime in my life and I've been able to, to really sit down and think about what matters and what makes me happy and what makes my family happy and what I want to do. And uh -huh. is that living in this particular city, is that working for this particular place? So you were seeing a lot of people in my circle get divorced. I'm seeing a lot of people relocate. I'm seeing a lot of people make major life changes mm -hmm. and they're, and, and quitting their job is part of that major life change that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because certain industries have not been impacted um, negatively during the recession. Like logistics is doing really well. It's exploding. Obviously healthcare is, um, is, is growing leaps and bounds. And then you have hospitality and the restaurant space, all trying to get back to where they were before. And those people that maybe were, um, uh, reduced, um, or laid off, they have found new places and new ways to make money and it fits better into their schedule and life. So, um, the great, realignment is really about 
what doing what feels good and kind of reassessing what matters to you. You've probably done it for yourself. Uh, for me, I've started going to, to Pilates class twice a week and, and I'm paying for extra things that in the past that I didn't think like I wouldn't have invested in, but I'm focusing more on myself and my mental health. Um, your people are, are doing the same thing. So people are just said, saying like, I, I don't need any more toxicity in my life. I'm leaving. And maybe they uh, were scared to, to not leave before, like fear was holding them back. Well, there's nothing more powerful than looking fear in the eye when you're losing a loved one or a family member um, through this pandemic or you're sick yourself. Uh, so it kind of makes you reevaluate what really matters. And uh, that's what people have been doing right now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The other thing I was wondering is if a lot of people are becoming entrepreneurs uh, to take they, control of their own are. destiny. <laughs> yeah. everybody, everybody has a side hustle, everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're not familiar with like the crypto space, I have so many friends that are, are much younger than me and they are investing in all this stuff and they don't have to work regular jobs because they have a whole system they're investing in. Um, I'm taking a class on non-fungible tokens or NFTs right now to try to understand more about the crypto space and stuff. I have friends who are millionaires and it was all because of crypto and NFTs and getting into them early. So wow. I think how we define success is really different. And I see more people uh, on Etsy. I see more people driving for Uber or DoorDash or doing different things. They have goals and it is not to work a regular nine to five anymore. They want to be able to have that flexibility uh, to do what they want to do. Wow. 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 The world has really changed. Okay, everybody, go ahead and take yourself, put yourself back on camera if you would take yourself off mute and let's go ahead and chat. Let's talk about any questions you've got. All right. Let's see if we can see everybody. I want to take a picture of you. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to bring everybody back on. Let's see here. So a lot of you are hiding your faces. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll give it a second. All right. So um, let's see here. If you just want to speak up to ask a question, let's do it that way. And then if it starts to get um, a little crazy, we'll go ahead and do the raise the hand thing. So what questions or comments do you guys have that you want to share with um, Jessica? Yeah, go ahead, Marsha. I've been staring at Audrey Hepburn behind you. What's the symbolism of that? Um, it's intentional. I um, decided that I wanted to have a reminder when you're looking at it of a powerful woman. Huh. Because I see, I have a friend and his name's Tim Sackett and he's a blogger in the HR space like me. He has an uh, online business. He's an influencer and he has this, I don't even remember who it is. It's somebody smoking a cigar, so a man. And um, I'm like, you know what? It, being a woman is amazing, but it's also really challenging. So I want to remind the people um, in my life that you can be glamorous and sexy and fun and successful all at the same time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've got a painting to my right. That's the same kind of idea. Absolutely. Okay, what else? What's what else is on your mind? I have a, have a question. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. Jessica, what would you say is your number one strategy that you would impart for women starting a business, especially women that are, let's say, over 50? <sighs> Ooh. This is a tough one, but I, I will say I'm really impressed with you. I'm going to, I'm going to creep on you after this. I, I was like, Ooh, okay, I got to check out your YouTube and see what you're doing. Um, I Good. think Good. my suggestion would be to pick one channel to start with. If you're going to do social media, I'm sorry, or, say it again, pick one channel to start with. If you're going to do social media or do something virtually, right. Um, I think that when we see other people, and I'm just going to assume for right now that I'm talking about digital community online, a product or something that you're selling, um, that you see other people, maybe like me, um, there's, a, there's other people I follow. I really like Shalene Johnson. I don't know if you know her, Shalene. Shalene is the founder of Payo, and um, she is a fitness guru, and now she runs uh, multiple seven-figure businesses. She has a planner. She has a social media company. She does all this stuff, and uh, she's just everywhere. So it's easy to look at, like, Shalene. Uh, another one is Brooke Castillo. She has a company called the Life Coach School. Um, I think she's on track to make $50 million this year in her business. Wow. And um, 
to see how she does it and for us to want to, to feel like we have to do it that way. And Shalene and Brooke and me, we've been doing this a really long time. Um, Shalene also, um, you know, she started her business and then generated some revenue and was able to make some investments in the business that she has now. Um, so pick one channel. Um, I think clarity, if I'm just talking about, if I'm just thinking about your business, um, be the more niche, the better is I think, because then you can be clear when I first started and I've been doing this a long time and I've made like all the mistakes, but when I first started, I was a resume writer. I was a career coach. I did social media. I wrote blogs. I did all the things and nobody really knew how to help or support me or send me business. So now we're, I try to be really clear about what we do and how we help people. And I think that that is um, really important for somebody who's starting out. Just be really clear. Um, the other thing I'll say, and I'll give an example that's happening right now is um, we have, so um, I do a lot of HR certification prep. That's one of the courses that we, we launched about uh, five years ago because I wasn't happy with uh, some of the programming that Sherm was providing for their certification. It was the same stuff that I did 20 years ago, same program, same link, not changing. It's not really reflective of our lives and how we, how we learn best. And so uh, one of our products that my community asked for that we developed is a practice test. And so we have a test bank of 700 questions and I have always sold it as it does everything, HRCI and Sherm. And you just buy it, it's $59 and you get access. And I sell a good fair amount of those. Um, but people kept telling me or asking me and saying, is this a Sherm product or is this an HRCI product for the two different certifications? And I'm like, well, honestly, the body of knowledge is not that much different, but Sherm and HRCI spend a lot of time to tell you that it's different. So I took the HR practice test and I made it into two products. We did modify some things, so it's a little bit different but we created one product and made it into two. So now when you go to the website and you look at it, you can pick SHRM or you can pick HRCI test questions. 97% the same as it was before. Took my team about seven hours to remake all the things, to rebuild the course, uh, to make all the new media, to change the messaging and the automation on it. Um, we have increased our sales this month by 500% just by doing that. So... I think that we all want to go out and make this big thing, but sometimes the, mo the small things are the ones that serve us the best and the ones that are highly specific to our community that make sense. Could you give us your uh, website URL? Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, so my website's uh, workology.com. If you want to look at all the courses that we have and creep on those, um, it's a uh, subdomain, it's learn.workology.com. Uh, you can also get there from Workology at, at the top um, right. There'll be a learning tab. Just click on it and it'll take you over there. Um, our best selling product is an audio course and it's seven and a half hours of audio where I'm just talking. I'm reading HR certification glossary terms and information for people um, for seven and a half hours. And so they listen to it in their car and when they're driving and when they're at the gym and um, it's $39 and I've sold a thousand over a thousand of those. Wow. wow. Okay. All right. Um, Susan Cheers is asking, could you talk about whether there have been new issues or challenges on HR as a result of the pandemic? And I would say, of course, yes. We need a whole nother like uh, three day conference for that. Yeah. Um, there are plenty. I think the one that's top of mind, um, and I would say that Christy and Julia are probably going to agree with me on this one, is um, the um, Supreme Court decision around vaccinations for employers. So um, there was um, OSHA was requiring or, or going to be inquiring vaccinations and mask mandates and testing and everything for employers over 100 employees or more. It was supposed to start on the 7th of January and then it got caught up in court. So the Supreme Court just decided on that um, this week. It's I think it was Tuesday. So I haven't read all the things, but um, be safe to say that uh, it's really up to the employer what they want to do. OSHA won't be enforcing anything uh, ar around that. Um, as far as other uh, changes, um, depending upon what state you're in, uh, there are some changes happening. I think New York is one, um, Colorado is one, but with the increase of remote hiring, 
a lot of employers are saying remote, open anywhere, we'll hire for anyone. If you are hiring in Colorado or New York, um, I believe right now, New York, I'm not 100% sure, but Colorado, I know, you need to include the salary range in your job posting that is um, now required by law. So um, there's going to be more pay transparency happening. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, as a recruiter, HR person, there was nothing worse for me than getting to the final interview with a candidate that I thought was going to be really great for my company only to find out that they wanted a, a salary that I couldn't work with. So I think the transparency is really good because it doesn't waste my time um, and, and yours. I think the best place for up-to-date information, um, I'm trying to think of the law firm. I just got this because I sent it over to my team. Fisher and Phillips in Oklahoma is really good with their updates. You should subscribe to that law firm um, there in town. They um, have offices in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. I always went to their legal seminars. Uh, but uh, SHRM is a really good resource for employment law changes as a result of the pandemic. Um, that's kind of been their focus. Uh, that's not my focus on my resources. I want to help with, with bigger picture strategy. Uh, but SHRM has a lot of great resources uh, on, on those changes. And they're good for small businesses too, regardless of your size, uh, whether you're small or large. Perfect. Perfect. You guys, we're just about out of time here. Let's see here. Oh, and, and somebody's asking about the spelling of SHRM. Oh, SHRM.org is, is their website. It's, um, they have a lot of free resources. Um, they have all these templates and, and different things too. So, um, hey, it's uh, Susie Knight here. Thanks, uh, Jessica, for, for being here. Good to see you, Donna. Um, I, uh, my question is, I, I mean, I followed that law a little bit recently. Um, I have a loved one right now in hospital for a uh, stroke. And so, you know, I'm paying more attention to it. And I mean, it's crazy what's going on out there. And I'm wondering, some states, some cities are coming out with mask mandates, right? And how does that fit into if you're working virtually? And what about vaccination? I mean, it's just all over the place right now. And uh, um, it's, in, I mean, I got a text this morning from someone just randomly who knows, you know, this loved one. And he was like, well, I hope Bob didn't get vaccinated. So, I mean, I can't, and so I'm wondering my reason to, to bring this up is, you know, for, from a strategy perspective, are you having conversations about this or are you just staying away from it, which is another option, another way to handle it? <laughs> I, I do like to have people. So I'm, I, I, I got my booster shot. Um, and uh, I'll tell no, you. No, I didn't was... mean stay away from that getting vaccinated. I meant staying away from the strategy or the, oh, oh, uh, the, um, the politicization of it. Not you, not asking you personally about your. Uh, <laughs> I was just, I was just going to say that I couldn't get my booster shot in, in, in Austin, Texas for over two weeks. So when I went to Oklahoma City, I went and got one. Wow. <laughs> because I couldn't get an appointment, but I could get one in Norman uh, while we were visiting. So, um, <laughs> I, it's, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. I, whoops. I just feel like SHRM is covering that information and they do a really good job of covering it for small business. Um, I'm one, I'm one who doesn't shy away from controversy. I, I will use bad language and explicit, explicatives <laughs> to get my point across. Um, I like disruption. Um, I just feel like I, I'm not an attorney. There are much better resources for that. Uh, we have written on it. I'd rather put together like 25 resources for employers who uh, are looking for how to lead their team better remotely than, than to talk about um, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why I partnered with a friend of mine to create a new manager training. So we have a 12 week new manager training that's all virtual. Um, that involves on-demand training. Uh, one, once a week, we have a new module. So we have on-demand training for 45 minutes. And then there's a group coaching call with a small group of 10 people. Um, and we, we do that for, for small groups every month. Um, I think the bigger challenge outside of the vaccination status and, and, and those things right now is how do we lead our people through right. this? How do exactly. We support them. <laughs> Um, you guys, unfortunately, I want to let you know, we're right on almost the uh, top of the hour. It's gone really fast. Yeah, and this has been terrific. Um, just quickly, could you summarize your top three learnings you want us to have gotten from you and the top three actions you want us to take? 
Um, I think um, number one, um, being a good leader and leading a team remote is more about um, you shifting than, um, than your employees shifting. So that means focusing on how you can better serve your community. Um, two, I, I definitely think we need to be supporting um, more minority groups, uh, women, especially women of color in this. Um, I, I love the mission that, that Donna and, and the team are working towards because it's something that uh, I, I am in full agreement with. Um, I also think that my third point would be like, because everything's changing now is the time to change. So if you're looking at doing something different, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You've already been through it. So that means could be getting a virtual assistant, trying a pilot with a remote team, offering some new benefits. Um, the sky's the limit for you, but it, it, I mean, the world's already in chaos. Um, this ripple is not going to be as big as the others your people are experiencing right now. That is a good point. That's a good point. Anything else in terms of actions you want us to take? Um, uh, I think if you have questions, um, shoot me an email, jessica at workology.com. Um, you can also visit the website and, and take a look. I'm, I'm always willing to, to have a conversation and, and talk more. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. This has been terrific. Um, you guys, I put these videos up um, as soon, like the day of or the day after. So if you want to share this with anyone, it's up on our website under purspower.com forward slash and then let's share the journey. Um, let's see here. just want to tell you who's coming up. So Nan McKay is going to be sharing her book, Gold in the Golden Years. She was just on here a second ago. She's going to be um, our speaker next week. And then we've got the um, monthly networking session on the 28th, and that is just pure networking. So please bring your friends. Let's collaborate. Let's get to know each other. And then I've got a very exciting guest coming up on February 4th. Captain Michael Abershoff is going to be joining us. Companies spend thousands bringing him in to talk. Um, he took the worst performing ship in the Navy and made it the best performing ship in the Navy. And he couldn't pay anybody more. He couldn't hire anybody. He couldn't fire anybody. And he managed to really do it through motivation. And I think that's what's needed right now in terms of engaging people. So that's on February 4th. Um, please sign up for a directory listing if you haven't already. I download the Google Chrome extension. Please like and share our social media pages. Um, let your friends know about this webcast. We do every Friday at 10 Central. And then Jessica, I'll give you a chance to say any last words. Um, no, just thank you, Donna. And, and it was a great group. Uh, what a great way to, to end my final, my, my Friday. Like you're my only meeting of the day. So I, I loved it and enjoyed it very much. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you guys for being here. Sure, appreciate it. Um, I did put a link for a survey in the chat. I'm trying to do a survey to really get what you guys want. You know, I want to understand your needs and wants, challenges to make sure that I'm delivering um, to help you. And one last comment, um, please remember, purse power, we have it. Let's use it. Take care, you guys. Have a great week. See you next Friday. Bye.